of you here. I have mentioned before how blessed we are with, with wonderful song leaders and multiple good song leaders. And maybe one thing that uh, doesn't get mentioned uh, often enough, we have song leaders who can adapt. And when they look at the clock and they say, well, okay, I'm going to adapt what I had planned and uh, get the preacher up there uh, and give the preacher time, because we all know the radio station cuts us off at 11. That <laughs> we, the, the radio broadcast will end at 11, wherever the sermon might be. And I appreciate that, uh, that our song leaders are, are on top of that, as well as doing a great job leading us in worship and directing our minds for the worship of our Lord. It is good to see you today. Wonderful to see each and every member, those who are visiting with us. We are glad that all of you are here today, and we do urge you to come and be with us every opportunity that you may have. I don't want to belabor the point of the service groups, but I'm going to say this. You hear a lot about the millennials and Generation Z, and people will say this or that about them. Something we know about the millennials and Generation Z is they want to serve. They want to serve in a meaningful way and they're looking for help in figuring out what they can do. And that's one of the things that these service groups are going to be able to do is to provide that direction that a lot of the members of this church family are looking for when it comes to serving as the Lord's people. And I am thankful uh, for the foresight in planning that that the elders had for uh, Trent and the other deacons who have been involved in this. Everyone with a hand in it, you've done a great job. And I look forward to seeing how this helps us to be stronger and to be the Lord's people in our community. One January, a man went into the local gym and he signed up. He was going to get fit in this coming year. And the year began and it went through and he didn't go to the gym. Not one time did he step foot in that gym there was always something else to do something he had to do or something he just preferred to do uh, than going to the gym and so the year passed the next year was beginning he walked back into the same gym and he goes and he signs up at the very same desk where he had been a year before and he's speaking to the young man who is there and he mentioned that he had done this last year and he never went to the gym he said Tell me, do you all have a name for people like me who sign up and never work out? And the young man smiled. He said, yes, prophet. <laughs> There's something to that. But you know, change can be difficult. Whether we're talking about our diet and health or we're talking about the habits in our life, our spiritual life, how we live before the Lord, to, to walk more closely with Him, change can be difficult. And yet, if we're going to follow Jesus, we're going to find as we live in Him, as we grow in Him, that we are changing along the way to become more and more like our Savior. In the book of Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, which we looked at a, a couple of weeks ago, Paul had written about Jesus. And there in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, we get that grand passage from the pen of the inspired apostle Paul that Jesus is divine, and yet he came to the earth, and he went to the cross for me and for you to save us from our sin. And Paul ends by saying, he is highly exalted, super exalted, because of what he has done for me and for you. Well, in the verses that follow that, Paul doesn't leave that line of thinking. Instead, what he does is he goes to show us that because of Jesus, because of who he is, because of what he has done, there is something that you and I need to do. And as we study the book of Philippians, we are finding a, a book of the New Testament that reminds us that as the Lord's people, we are together in love. We are together in joy. And that is true because we are together in Christ. Well, now we see that this isn't something that's just going to happen, but we need to change the way we live our life. And it's a change that is based on Jesus. 
It's a change that is based on who he is and what he has done. And that's what Paul is bringing us here in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. Paul shows us that because of Jesus, there is a certain way for us to live. He tells us in the first place that because of Jesus, we need to be faithful. Be faithful. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, beginning, Paul wrote, Therefore, my beloved, that word therefore should be our clue to let us know that what Paul is now saying is based on what he had already written. Because of Jesus, because of his greatness, because he is highly exalted, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Paul here addresses his brethren, my beloved. It's a word that means dear or dearly loved, cherished. It implied a, a close personal relationship, and that's the way Paul thought of his brethren. I'm convinced this is one of the reasons that, that preachers love the book of Philippians so much, is it reminds us of, of our relationship with, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. My beloved, he said, as you have always obeyed. And Paul used here a particular word for obeyed. It comes from the same word as the word that's usually translated to hear. But, but this word has to do with hearing in such a way that one is obedient. Anybody can hear a message and have the, the signal hit the brain, but, but this is a particular kind of hearing. This is hearing in such a way that one does it, and that's what Paul is writing to these brethren. You have done this. You have heard the word, and you have obeyed it, and I want you to keep doing it. Verse 13, he says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Paul says you keep obeying because while you are obeying, God is working in you. Now remember in this, Paul was writing to Christians. And he told Christians, work out your salvation. He's not talking about how to become a Christian. He was writing to Christians. They had done that. They were, they were in Christ. He's, he's writing to them about how to remain faithful. He's writing to them about how to keep living in Jesus, how to keep following the Lord. The teaching that we hear from time to time, it's sometimes called once saved, always saved or the impossibility of apostasy, that, that a child of God cannot fall away from the Lord. Folks, it's not biblical. And Paul here writing to the brethren, telling them, I, I want you to work out your own, own salvation with fear and trembling. He's saying, you need to stay faithful. He's reminding us of this fact. We might think about what James had written in James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. There, as James was writing, he says, brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and he goes on and says someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sin. James there says that, that one of us, a Christian who wanders away, needs to be brought back lest their soul is lost. And so we know it is possible for a Christian to wander away, to become unfaithful. And that's what Paul is writing about here in Philippians chapter 2. Work out your own salvation. Keep following Jesus. Be faithful to Him. It could have to do with our presence when the church gathers. That because the church has gathered, we're going to be present with God's people. It reaches into our prayer life. That we go before the throne of God and, and we bow before Him. We give gratitude to Him. We, we ask Him for those things that we need. And, and we give th that thanks to Him for our brethren and for Him and what He has done. It, it reaches into our study that we open the pages of the Bible 
and learn from it and apply those things to our life. It goes to our words and to our actions, but we're talking about walking in Jesus, and sometimes we do struggle in this. Sometimes it is difficult. In John chapter 17, John records that prayer of Jesus for his followers, and Jesus, as he prayed for for those who belong to him, he, he pointed out that the world has hated them, that is, those who follow Jesus. That that comes to me and you today. The world has hated his people because we are not of the world. And in John 17 and verse 15, as Jesus prayed to the Father, he said, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Sometimes we'll use the phrase, or maybe we've heard it, that as Christians we are in the world but not of the world. While those specific words in that order are not found in the New Testament, the teaching is right here in John chapter 17. It's what Jesus said. We are not of the world. He has not prayed that the Father would take us out of the world, but that as His people, we will be faithful. So in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, as Paul was writing to his brethren, back in verse 1, he had said, as Christians, we should see our life as a living sacrifice, that we've given ourselves to serve God. Verse 2, he says, and do not be conformed to this world. That is, don't be made over in the image of of this world but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind well that's what Paul is saying be faithful keep walking in those footsteps of Jesus we have given ourselves to him and so let's keep it up let's follow him faithfully work out your own salvation with fear and trembling it isn't always easy but when you do it God is working through you. That's what Paul says, be faithful because of Jesus. And then number two, he says, because of Jesus, be encouraging. Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 14, Paul continues in this writing saying, do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Now think about what he says. Do all things, he says, without complaining. That that word for complaining means murmuring. One resource calls it behind-the-scenes talk. We know what that is. When somebody doesn't like something, they go to their little group of close friends and family members and they sort of begin to gripe and fuss about those things in their little group to get some support behind what they don't like. Well, Paul says, Christian, don't do that. Do all things without complaining and without disputing. The word for disputing is a word that could have either a a positive or a, a negative sense to it here it's obviously being used in a negative sense something we should not do a a verb form of this word is found in mark chapter 9 and verse 33 where we find the apostles arguing among themselves about who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom and that's exactly the idea of the word here it has to do with arguing with looking for an argument always being ready to find that that sense of conflict somewhere And so Paul says, instead of murmuring and arguing, he says, be blameless, be harmless, live as the children of God. Now look at Philippians 2 verse 16, he continues saying, holding fast the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. He said, I want you to continue to follow Jesus following Him doctrinally, following Him in your attitudes, following Him in your morality, in your actions, so that I know that my teaching has taken root with you. Paul says, because we follow Jesus, we're not going to be nitpicking and critical, looking for something to get one over on someone else. That that idea of, of murmuring, of arguing, 
And I'm not talking about the way we sometimes sort of joke around with each other. I think we all understand one another well enough to be able to catch on to that. That's, that's not what Paul is writing about. That's not what I'm talking about here. But the real complaining, the real arguing that some would do, well, those Christians who knew their Old Testament would have had a pretty good picture of it. We might think about the people of Israel in our Sunday morning Bible class here in the auditorium. We're studying the book of Exodus and and we're looking at the people of Israel as they're leaving Egyptian slavery. And, and we find them murmuring. Exodus chapter 15 because they don't have water. Chapter 16 because they don't have food. Chapter 17 again because they don't have water. Chapter 32 because Moses went up on the mountain. And he sure has been there for a long time. And what are we going to do now? So they start murmuring and complaining. Numbers chapter 14 because they don't think they can enter the promised land. Numbers chapter 16, they're upset about the leadership, Moses and, and Aaron, and, and so they murmur and complain and argue about that. Chapter 21, the difficulty of their travel over and over, Israel murmured, they complained. Aren't you glad we're not like that? If you're like me, sometimes when I preach, somebody will say, boy, you really stepped on my toes today. Listen, if I did, I guarantee you all week long I've been rolling on my own. That's, that's what my study is. And sometimes we have to look at ourselves and say, maybe I'm starting to, to get a little propensity for this. Maybe I'm getting a little too argumentative over here. Maybe I'm, I'm complaining and murmuring. That's how we need to look at this, to ask ourselves, how can I improve that's what Paul told these brethren. If you're walking in the footsteps of Jesus being faithful, then be encouraging. Don't complain. Don't be argumentative. Be encouraging. And Paul has one more point to make. Number three, he goes on to tell the brethren, because of Jesus, because of who he is, be joyful. Look now with me at Philippians chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. As Paul is closing out this, this particular paragraph, paragraph in Philippians chapter 2 Philippians 2 verse 17 he says yes and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and and service of your faith I am glad and rejoice with you all and for this same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me Paul says, if I am not released from prison, remember he's, he's writing Philippians as a prisoner of the Romans, if I am not released from prison and I'm poured out like a drink offering, in the old law there was a drink offering that would be poured over some of the things that were given and, and that was the drink offering. Now Paul is not suggesting in any way, shape or form that he is the sacrifice to take away sin. What he is saying is my life is a sacrifice before God and, and if that's what happens, if my life is poured out like that drink offering, he says I still rejoice in this. Now, okay. There are two Greek words on the screen. You don't need to remember those. You don't need to remember those in two seconds, much less for your eternity. But there's something interesting that happens here. Because in these two verses, four of the 16 uses of Paul's joy or rejoice, four of them are in these two verses. Cairo, rejoice or be glad, and soon Cairo, which is rejoice with. Paul uses that four times in these two verses. If this is what happens, if my life comes to an end, I want you to rejoice and rejoice with me because I rejoice and I rejoice with you. Paul is hammering home that idea of joy. He thought that he might be released by the Romans, but even if not, he says, we can rejoice. Somebody says, but you don't understand. You can't really rejoice when bad things happen. That's just not the way we are. It's, it's not the way life is. You can't rejoice when things aren't good. Remember when Paul wrote that, he was being held as a prisoner by the Romans. 
And yet he said, I rejoice and I want you to rejoice with me. Not only that, 10 years when Paul had been there in the city of Philippi, teaching and preaching, Silas, his co-worker, by his side. Remember, they were arrested for doing good. And they were taken, they were beaten, they were placed into the innermost part of the prison. Their feet were fastened to the floor by the stocks. There they were, beaten, arrested in the prison. Acts chapter 16, verse 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Paul wasn't just telling these brethren even if something terrible happens, find a way to rejoice through it. He was reminding them he had done that. He was doing that, and he wanted them to do the same thing. Well, how do you do that? Well, it goes back to Philippians 2 and verse 12. That little word, therefore. When Paul is beginning this section, he begins it with therefore, based on Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, because of Jesus, who he is, what he has done, because he is highly exalted, then we can be joyful. Even when things don't go our way. Friend, it does not mean that you're not going to have a bad day or a bad week or bad season of life. Those things come to us no matter who we are. It does not mean that you won't have times that you feel low. It does not mean that there won't be times that you struggle. What it means is that when we are in that valley, when, when we can only try to remember what it was like when we were on the peak of, of that joy in the Lord, when we're in that valley, we don't build a house there so we can stay. But we look through the clouds to see our Lord, to see who He is, to see what He has done for us. And we keep our focus on Him. We see the Son of God even in our trouble and in Him we can see that there is joy. Yes, I struggle now. I'm having my ups and downs now. But I can have joy in Christ even in the middle of this. That's what Paul is talking about when he says be joyful. Paul wrote, to the church at Philippi. And he said, we are together in love. We are together in joy. And it's because we are together in Christ. And what that means is we put self aside so, so that we can focus on Jesus. And when we do that, we need to be faithful, to be encouraging, to be joyful. Maybe you've seen or, or maybe you had it done to you, the little knee-jerk test that doctors might do. They'll use a small mallet or, or maybe the, the side of their hand to hit the patellar tendon just below the, the kneecap. And, and when they do it, when the patient is seated and relaxed, the foot moves forward. And, and the reason the foot moves is that hitting that tendon sends a message to the quadriceps to contract. And when the quadriceps can contract, the foot moves forward. That's just how the body works. And if the reflex is slow, or if the foot doesn't move at all, the doctor knows there's a problem in the nervous system. Something is wrong in the body's line of communication that needs to be addressed. It's a test. Well, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18, Paul is giving us a test. He's saying, if you are together in Christ, then this is your life. You will be faithful. You will be encouraging. You will be joyful. And friends, if we are not, then something's wrong. Maybe we didn't hear and obey something that the Bible says. Maybe, maybe we started in the Lord and, and we haven't continued in Him. And, and if that's where you find yourself, then you need to make things right. If you have been unfaithful to the Lord in your words and your actions, in some moral sin or, or through murmuring and, and complaining, then come home. He's waiting for you. 
Or if you've never come to Jesus as the New Testament teaches, then come to Him. You need to be washed from your sin by His blood, hearing the Word of God believe. Repent of your sin, confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and be buried with Him in baptism for the remission of your sins. And when you do that, your sins are washed away. You become a Christian. You become a child of God. Won't you come to Him as we stand and as we sing? Oh, <laughs> 